Good afternoon. So it is my great pleasure to welcome you to the Nishla end of year celebration. And we have a lot planned for the next three hours. But the first thing we'll do is the second annual Dr. Catherine Curran Lecture. And to give you a little bit of background on the Catherine Curran Lecture Series, it was designed with the idea of bringing together community. Dr. Curran worked very, very hard at developing a strong sense of community, both internal to the department and externally as well. And when we were thinking about the speaker for this year's second annual Catherine Curran Lecture Series, perhaps there was no greater example of the importance of community than when it came to our teacher, our colleague, and our friend um, experiencing something that, albeit very personal, um, brought together community under very intense circumstances. So I think we still remain very true to the theme of community because the story you will hear, our colleague Dr. Jean Lundy's discussion and her narrative, her story, in terms of the misadventures with a systemic bacterial infection, although this is her story, it's a story that so many of us shared in, and so many of us are just in awe of the incredible woman who is at the center of this story and this community. So without much more from me, I'm going to welcome Dr. Lundy. Uh, after the inaugural lecture, we'll do just a few announcements about new faculty, retiring faculty, but I'm not going to talk about that yet because you until that time are still not retired. Um, and Nishla has some announcements. And then we will socialize, which is not something we all get to do on an everyday basis <laughs> with each other in 114. So please help me in welcoming Dr. Jean Lundy. Thank you for coming. It's a nice crowd, so I was wondering if I was just going to be speaking to my friends, <laughs> a lot of who are here, but I see Kelly's here, Brand's here, so um, it's wonderful. This was quite the misadventure with a systemic bacterial infection. Took me by surprise. The day after Thanksgiving, I was supposed to babysit Wilt, my boyfriend's little grandson, Sebastian. And this was going to be great fun for me because, as you know, I love babies. And he's just two and a half. So um, I didn't feel well. I couldn't do it. So I told Wilt, you're on your own. You're going to have to babysit without me. Well. That's what Wilt did, but he kept phoning me to see how I felt, and I wouldn't answer, and he thought, good, she's getting some rest, because as you, we could all use some more sleep. <laughs> so it was a while before Sebastian's mother came. It was evening, and he was free to come check on me. That was a surprise for him. I was in a coma and non-responsive, and so he, um, he said, I knew I'd get a rise out of you if I said, I'm calling 911, and no rise out of me. <laughs> so uh, he did call 911, and I live pretty close to St. Anthony Hospital, so the ambulance got there in short order, and I was whisked away um, to the emergency room. Here's what the emergency room admission report said. See if this sounds like me. Patient is nonverbal but appears to be awake. She has a blank stare, does not track visually. 
makes only brief eye contact and does not respond to verbal questioning or follow commands. There is minimal response to painful stimuli. And that was, they told me, a hard knuckle rub on the sternum. And I guess that's not comfortable, and I gave him almost no reaction. Altered mental status. So that was the day after Thanksgiving, and the admitting diagnosis was clinical sepsis. I didn't really understand sepsis. Maybe that's not a term that's familiar to you, so I looked it up. It's the body's inflammatory response to a bacterial infection. It's bad news. The doctors are, you know, in a tough situation of trying to stop this downward spiral as the body's about to succumb to the infection. It's a resource-intensive emergency medicine condition with a high mortality rate. And yet, Thanksgiving morning, I was great. Uh, we finished a fast hike up Carpenter's Peak on Roxborough Park, Wilt and I. Felt great, not the least bit tired. Everything was fine the morning of Thanksgiving. But now it was one day later, and what was happening to me? I was in a coma, febrile, you know that term is fever, of 105. It's pretty hot. I had tachypneic, I was tapicneic, I had to look up how to pronounce that, rapid breathing due to the fever. The emergency room doctors, they were scrambling. Wilt was saying, she was fine yesterday. Um, they took samples of venous blood, which means from my veins, and cerebral spinal fluid from a lumbar puncture or tap, and they found elevated, vacuolated neutrophils of 97 percent. Who knows what this, what is normal? Normal is zero to six percent. 97 is not close to zero. Um, so its presence indicates a life-threatening infection. I had glucose level of 147, and normal is 70 to 99. It's elevated in patients with infection. My white blood cell count was way elevated, 198, which the report said did not clear. Um, normal is 4.5 to 11. So my body was making lots of white blood cells to try to counteract this infection. So what was happening to me was sepsis. I had elevated serum lactate of seven, and I know that these terms don't mean anything to you, probably. Um, I had to look them all up. But seven is no good uh, following emergency room treat a emergency room treatment, the lactate dropped to 2.6, but normal is 0.5 to 1, um, and it's elevated because of infection. I read a level of 2.5 or higher is associated with increased patient mortality, and they couldn't get me down lower than 2.6. I had reduced potassium of 2.9. That potassium count haunted me the entire time I was in the um, hospital. It was always too low um, because infection eats potassium. I had elevated blood urea nitrogen of 25 and normal is 2.5 to 7.1. I was always the wrong numbers. If it's supposed to be high, I was low. If something's supposed to be low, I was high. So what was happening to me was sepsis. Um, the cerebrospinal protein was 59, and it's supposed to be between 15 and 45. Cerebrospinal glucose was 82. It's supposed to be between 2.5 and, and 4.4. So both levels show the infection was in my central nervous system. I had reduced glomerular filtration rate of 46.9 and normals above 60. This was reflecting what they called acute kidney injury. Um, it was 
injured from the bacterial infection and massive doses of antibiotics that were doing my kidney in um, emer in the emergency room. But those massive doses were not getting rid of the infection, even though they were harming the kidney, they weren't doing the job. The question was, what kind of infection? They tested me for everything. Meningitis, Listeria, West Nile, Encephalitis, and other bacteria, and the blood showed it was Staphyloc Staphylococcus aureus, or Staph for short. So when cultured, the Staph grew in less than a day when it generally takes three days to test positive. But the concentration was so high in my body, it revealed itself pretty soon. Because it was so high, the doctor said, I probably have the staph infection for weeks, maybe even months. But my strong body was able to kind of keep it at bay, keep control until it couldn't any longer. And the bacteria began to take over. My blood infected with staph was carried everywhere, um, contaminated my heart, brain, kidneys. So I'll talk about each of those organs. Staph infected my heart. There's something called troponin, which is a protein released by the damaged heart muscle. <laughs> Do you guys in anatomy know troponin? <laughs> All right, this is not a good number. Um, I was 1.9 at admission. It went up the next day to 4.4, then 11.6, then 165. Normal is zero, um, or 0 0.045. A cardiac catheter was threaded through an artery in my wrist so that the heart could be imaged. Um, and dye was introduced, and the findings from the imaging, I had abnormal repolarization, which meant that the damaged valves were allowing backwashing. The blood wasn't all going in one direction from my chambers. I had myocarditis, heart muscle inflammation, can lead to, this was bad to read, cardiac dysfunction, heart failure, and sudden death. The emergency room doctor's report on day two, patient in critical condition with new diagnoses, cardio, myocarditis and staph and worsening. Yikes. Not just my heart, but staph infected my kidneys. This acute kidney injury from the staph infection caused my kidneys to be dumping good stuff like protein and ketones into my urine and no longer filtering bad stuff, wastes, and it was just not functioning, that, those kidneys. And one symptom was fluid retention. Look at the size of my knees. My friend took this picture. She goes, I got to get a picture of this. <laughs> my knees were like this big around. I was weighed every Get up, we need to weigh you. Um, I gained 10 pounds by day four, 40 pounds by day 14, 45 pounds by day 25. Every time I went to the scale, it was three or four more pounds. I'm going, oh my goodness. So my swollen knees, my swollen ankles made it really hard to walk. I couldn't bend. I couldn't bend my knees, I couldn't bend, bend my ankles, so I was like this giant tree trunks that I was trying to maneuver is how it felt. But they couldn't do what they said, aggressive diuresis, because my kidneys couldn't take it. So I just kept getting bigger and more swollen. Now, can you see above my puffy ankles, red ring, uh, that was a staph-based skin infection, cellulitis rash. Not just my heart, not just my kidneys, my eye. The left carotid artery
with the ophthalmic branch carried the staph infection to my left eye, didn't go on the right side. So that was the good news. Right eye was not affected, but the left eye really was. The vision diminished to 20 over 200 at hospital discharge, which is the definition of legally blind. But worst of all, staph infected my brain. These germ pods were being flicked off my contaminated valve and sent to my brain, causing septic emboli. So that's a bacterial infection originating in the heart valves and carried by the blood vessels to the brain, in this case, other parts of the body. I had infectious diseases, doctors, and they said we've got to get IV antibiotics in that can cross the blood-brain barrier and attack those germ pods. So I didn't suffer strokes from the usual etiologies that are blood-related, like blood clots, blood hemorrhaging, um, but I had this vegetative mass from the staph that was being deposited in multiple places in my brain. These damaged areas were called septic strokes, and they were clearly visible on the MRI. Uh, the doctors showed welt like 10 spots in my brain that were being zapped by these septic strokes. The medical report said, patient's brain is at high risk for recurrent septic strokes. What was I acting like? I thought you might be interested in how my behavior was changing from the staff. First, I read the doctor's reports. Day two answers Jean to every question. Do you know why you're here, Jean? <laughs> I couldn't seem to get off. I, there was other evidence of perseveration, but that was the first one. I just kept saying, Jean, that must be the answer they're seeking. Day three. The doctor said, wide-based, unsteady gait. And I hadn't even gained weight by day three. Um, when asked where she is, patient responded, in a resort, and everyone is so nice. <laughs> what do I know of resorts? <laughs> On day four, responds to simple questions with one to three words, correctly responds after some delay to questions about her age and where she lives, but can I, cannot identify her children's ages, can name days of the week, but not months of the year. This will surprise you. On day six, patient is able to answer questions appropriately. Name, date of birth, simple math. <laughs> really? Did the stroke improve me? <laughs> Location, why she is hospitalized. On day seven, day seven, patient is much more alert and oriented. Neurofunction is normal baseline, comfortable on sitting in chair, able to have a conversation. So things were looking better after the first week. More behavioral changes here. This is from family and friends. On day four, I used a monotone voice to say to Catherine repeatedly, I had a stroke, I had a stroke. She remembers all of this. I also perseverated on requesting water. So the nurse would say, I don't know, you've had a lot of water, let's wait a while. I said, okay, can I have some water? <laughs> okay, can I have some water? First two weeks, Catherine noted a trait that was not at all characteristic. I expressed no concern about being absent from work, <laughs> about my classes, about terribly inconveniencing my colleagues. <laughs> Didn't matter to me. <laughs> when Catherine reported that um, indifference to Jessica, she became very alarmed. <laughs> <laughs> An occupational therapist came to the room and assessed my motor planning and coordination. So this was reported by my nephew. The OT placed a spoon and a bowl of oatmeal in front of me and said, I want you to take some bites. My nephew said, well, Angina, at least you did pick up the spoon with the handle. So I picked up the spoon, 
dipped it in the oatmeal and went. <laughs> he said, I just sat there for a minute thinking that didn't work. So another spoonful. He said, I sat there and thought how I could redo this. Next bite, made the mark. <laughs> but he said it took 20 tries before I could get from here to here. While my sister-in-law was visiting, the OT placed toothpaste and a toothbrush in front of me and said, I want you to brush your teeth. I did pick up the toothbrush correctly, and I knew how to squirt the toothpaste. Sharon, my sister-in-law, helped me find my mouth. That was hard. For 40 minutes, I couldn't stop. The OT finally, after 40 minutes, said, that's enough. He kept waiting for me to recognize I had brushed my teeth, but I never did. So more family and friends reports, because I asked everybody, tell me what I might have forgotten. Um, the physical therapist would walk me down the hall in my walker. Does it sound like the one you know? The professor you know? I'm usually a pretty fast walker. Right, Catherine? <laughs> I was in my walker, pushing myself down the hallway, and I had a strap around my waist, and the PT held on to me like he's walking a dog. Um, I didn't need him to hold me up, but if I was going down, he would be able to control it. And Wilt says I just kept veering to the left and hitting my walker into the wall. I couldn't seem to keep on track. And maybe it was balance issues from the stroke, maybe it was motor problems, maybe it was that I was blind in the side and I had no peripheral vision. I don't know, but I wasn't good about walking down the hall. And it would exhaust me a halfway down the hall trip. And I'd be going, oh, I'm so tired, and barely could make it back to my bed. But I did have some encouraging signs that cognition was starting to improve. This is a report from my son. Ben and my daughter-in-law were in the ICU after I had been wheeled back in from an intubation and extubation procedure. And the rule is, you know, they've just numbed you. Um, you can't swallow efficiently. So they make you wait two hours before you have water. So I asked for water, and the ICU nurse said no. And I tried again. ICU said nurse, nurse said no. So my daughter-in-law was snickering in the corner as I said, I don't think you should apply that rule uniformly. I think you should test your patient to see maybe I can swallow fine. Maybe I should get some water. She's over there going, she's very determined. <laughs> and uh, he resisted. He, finally, I badgered him for water. He said, I'll give you some ice chips. So he gave me a spoonful of ice chips, and I laid back in, against my pillow, and I said, Kristen, this is as good as your key lime pie. <laughs> Some more behavioral changes. During my hospital stay, people were visiting, and they would bring things they thought I would love to eat, like pizza from my favorite restaurant. Has anybody been to Front Room Pizza in Lakewood? All right, Jackie knows. It's fabulous, best pizza around. So my friend Karen would bring me a little personal pan pizza. No interest. And then Wilt said she loves chocolate milkshakes. Lots of chocolate milkshakes were coming in. I tried to be a gracious receiver and, you know, act like I wanted what people were bringing me, but nothing tasted right. I was not interested. And I have not had any pizza or chocolate milkshake since I was in the hospital. It's a long time to go without those things when you used to love them. I don't love them now. <laughs> nope. 
Catherine had to smile and be encouraged when the neurologist asked me, who is the president of the United States? And I grimaced and said, Trump. <laughs> Catherine said she felt so encouraged that I could progress. I could get better. <laughs> there was something of me left in there. I was eager to get out of the hospital and back home. Um, but as the day of discharge got closer, I realized I have absolutely nothing I can fit into. For weeks, all I'd worn was a hospital gown and it accommodated my increasing girth, but then I was gonna to have to put on clothes and the clothes that I wore in the day after Thanksgiving, no way. So my sister-in-law, Sharon, had just gone through Weight Watchers and had lost like 35, maybe 40 pounds. And Catherine had these big clogs that she had bought extra large because she wore all these orthotics in them because of her foot problems. She brings me these big clogs, Sharon brings me these giant clothes, and I could barely squeeze into either one. But I l was able to leave the hospital without wearing a hospital gown. <sighs> it was a rocky road to recovery. I spent 28 days in the hospital. First. Hospitalization was 25 days. Re-hospitalization, two bit days. Another hospitalization, one more day. Early blood test reported no oxacillin resistance. Very good news. That meant that oxacillin antibodies could be used um, to fight my staph infection. They could cross that blood brain barrier. They could go after those germ pods and I was on that intravenous oxacillin for every three hours, round the clock, for 55 days. But I had so much chest pain, back pain, and the fear was, had the staph infection spread? You know, was I having blood clots maybe in my lungs? Was it in my spine? I had so many imaging tests. In fact, I was looking back and I had 12 imaging in four weeks. They just kept trying to find answers to why I was in so much pain. It hadn't spread um, to my spine or I didn't have blood clots in the lungs. Phew. But my lungs had filled with fluid and needed to be drained. Oh man, was that painful. I want you to feel sorry for me. I made all the nurses feel sorry for me. The third hospitalization occurred on my birthday. So like 15 times a day, they go, what's your birthday? And I go, today, 65 years earlier. And they go, you're here on your birthday? And I go, yes, feel sorry for me. And they, they did. But it was a bumpy road to recovery. And I had to accept pain as just part of everyday life. The nephrology or the kidney doctor's report said, course complicated by worsening pulmonary edema, which means I was having swelling um, and what it felt like to me that I couldn't breathe without pain. So that was what it felt like. And then the doctor's uh, uh, report go on, goes on to say, lower extremity edema. And what it felt like to me was I could not maneuver these giant legs. But breathing pain, moving pain, nothing compared to that drainage of the fluid in my lungs. The intense pain caused me to go into Lama's breathing for five solid hours. They were trying to give me pain medicine, but it was not controllable pain. I was just on the verge of panic from it feeling like, you know, I was just going to lose control. Um, it was way worse than the heart surgery, which I'll talk about in a little bit. The pain from heart surgery, nothing compared to this pain. And labor and delivery of my four sons, ha, that was a breeze compared to this. So given the level and duration of this pain, um, a nurse, my sister-in-law, told me that the pulmonary specialists, when they were doing this drainage procedure, 
they must have nicked a nerve. They must have hurt a nerve going in, um, which explains why the pain in my back kept returning for many days. And it was like from shoulder to shoulder all the way across my back. The bumpy road to recovery included the fact that both arms got blood clots. The nurses who check your blood pressure a lot in a day could not use either arm to check my blood pressure. They had to go to my giant legs, and it was um, misleading. I guess blood pressure in your legs is not, diff not easy to take, and it doesn't ever match your blood pressure in your arms. So they weren't sure what my blood pressure was. And I couldn't sleep laying down. I had to always sit up because then I could have less pain upon breathing. I felt like I couldn't breathe at all if I laid down. So bending isn't that great for my lower extremities edema. You know, building at the, bending at the hip, bending at the knees, it was interfering with the, getting rid of this fluid. So I just maintained this 45 pound weight gain um, and I asked one of the hospitalists, do you know the term hospitalist? So you go to the doctor and there's the doctor in the doctor's office. A hospital doesn't have, a hospitalist doesn't have an office. And the doctor that you see in the office doesn't go to the hospital. So the hospitalist sees, like my doctor that I would go to the office and see, her patients in the hospital. So I got to know uh, there were probably maybe six hospitalists for my primary care physician. And uh, so I asked one of them, how long will I not be able to lay down and breathe? And he said, could be weeks, could be months. I couldn't read due to my vision loss. But it was time to write students' letters of recommendation to grad school. So Catherine would read me the form that I was supposed to answer, and I would dictate, and she would type in the answer on the form. My son increased the font size on my phone to maximum so that I could text. It was really tedious to text, but I felt like I should do it. It felt like therapy, you know? And so I keep having to backtrack and correct. You know, I don't like <laughs> errors in written language, but it was very effortful and tedious to send a text. But I, I really felt like I wanted to keep doing it, that it was gonna help me. So the oxacillin use over 45 days totally killed my appetite. My taste buds were zapped. Nothing tasted good. Even not having anything didn't taste good. There was this taste in my mouth all the time that was bad. And they, the doctors would say, well, can you describe it? Is it like metallic? And I go, no, it's just bad. I couldn't even think of words to describe the taste in my mouth. Water was awful. Orange juice was awful. Milk was awful. You know, drinks I used to love, nothing was good. It was getting a little worrisome to the doctor, so the cardiac surgeon was considering tube feeding. Wow, that would have been terrible. Somebody suggested to ease the bad taste in my mouth, I could buy alkaline water. It didn't help. Especially disgusting toothpaste. Not appealing, baked goods, banana bread, cakes, cookies. My friends suffered because I wouldn't bake anymore. <laughs> you know, previously these were special treats that I would love to bake and share. No, I didn't want to eat any of that stuff. So then I lost 20 pounds. You know, I came from way high on the weight. There's my normal weight. I go 20 pounds low. I'm still that low. I can't keep up my old skirts. Can't keep up my old pants. Dresses are okay, but I had to replace half my wardrobe. Do you like my new skirt? 
I took it to uh, Taylor and she took about four inches out. Bumpy road to recovery. They did a transesophageal echocardiogram, which identified endocarditis, which is infection of the endocardium. This is the anatomy students that are right with me, right? The inner lining of the chest, heart chambers, and heart valves. And vegetative mass from the staph infection was covering my mitral valve. That required open heart surgery. Or my brain would be, what the report said, at continued risk for catastrophic, catastrophic embolic events. Not good. From this infected heart valve. Bad sign, my white blood cell count was rising, 8 to 13 to 21. It was trying, my body was trying hard to fight this infection. I had to have a temporary pacemaker. So my heart, it was so traumatized it couldn't fire synchronously. Um, so I had to have this pacemaker that would give electrical pulses. So this box that was attached to me, and then I had these cords going in me. I still have the scars, um, and it would trigger my heart to beat at a normal rate. Now, if my heart could recover, I would get that temporary pacemaker removed. If not, it would have to be permanently implanted, well, a permanent one. This one was way too big to permanently implant. So here's my open heart surgery discussion. Does this heart look like something the anatomy students recognize? So the aorta up the top. Aortic valve and the mitral valve are what is going to come up in our story next. The open heart surgery was needed so that I wouldn't keep having these septic strokes, but the doctor couldn't operate because the staff was, you know, going to contaminate the valves, the new valve. So uh, he had to wait until December 6th, so remember day after Thanksgiving to December 6th, trying to get the antibiotics to do the job so that he could go in and cut me open. So he used a sternum saw. <laughs> cut through my sternum, split it open, opens me up, and uh, that was a sternotomy. And I was hooked to a heart-lung machine, or a cardiopulmonary bypass machine, which did all the work. My blood would go to the machine, get oxygenated, get the waste products removed, come back to my body. Pretty wild. They clamped the aorta shut, they put an ice pack on my heart. They injected some kind of relaxant drug into my heart. And it was fully arrested, as the report said, or not beating for guess how long? Somebody take a guess. Seven minutes. Seven minutes. Well, in between those two. <laughs> 108 minutes. But like what? 12 minutes short of two hours, that's amazing to me that I could not rely on the heart-lung machine forever, but that my heart went back to beating. And so I said to the surgeon, well, how'd you get it to start beating again? He goes, the heart wants to beat. I unclamped the aorta, I took off the ice pack, I gave um, an antidote to the relaxant injection, and it just starts beating again. But before that happened, uh, the duration of the heart surgery was six hours and 15 minutes. Doesn't that seem like a long time to be bending over a heart patient, doing all their jobs? Six hours and 15 minutes. So after the chest was opened up, uh, my heart could be visualized, and the surgeon found a large thrombus, or a blood clot, on the aortic valve and he had to scrape it off, and he was sending numerous cultures from the operating room to the lab to see how everything was. Was there staff? Two cultures tested positive for staff, which disappointed him, and one of them was the thrombus. The outside was clear, the inside, the staff was still there. He saw two leaflets of the mitral valve had been totally destroyed. 
Um, so we had to remove the bad valve and replace it with a bioprosthetic tissue, bovine tissue. I'm now part cow. <laughs> so here was the surgeon's report. This was a technically demanding case given the patient's severe endocarditis. She was taken to the cardiac surgical ICU in stable but critical condition. It was a bumpy road, but good news. No more staff on the valves following the open heart surgery. The repaired aortic valve, the replaced mitral valve functioned perfectly. I had mandated sternal precautions, and, you know, like sawed open the sternum, and you don't like get a cast, you don't get anything to hold it together, so you can't put your arms out like this. You always had to keep your arms close to your core. Um, you could put no weight on your arms, and you could not lift more than five pounds. That is pretty much nothing. Um, so I had to visualize myself as Tyrannosaurus Rex with little useless arms and just not use them for much. I got no more pacemaker. Um, it was needed only temporarily, um, later removed as my heart recovered from the staph infection and from the surgical trauma. It began to beat rhythmically. Yay. No more septic strokes in the brain. End of those vegetative mass areas being dis deposited in my brain. And what's interesting and you know, relieving to me is that the neurological tissue underneath was still OK. It started recovering once that vegetative mass could be off. My kidneys started getting better. No more acute kidney injury which those cases can progress to chronic kidney disease, um, but didn't happen in my case. I didn't have to go on dialysis. Good news for my eye. The left eye was no longer under attack. No more bacterial infection going through that carotid artery, ophthalmic branch. Um, the retina had this vegetative mass on it, but it was getting resolved by the antibiotics. So that legally blind left eye started recovering. My vision started getting better. What a relief. Um, I went to a neuro-ophthalmologist. How's that for a specialty? Neuro-ophthalmologist. And she found that um, I was at 51 or 2150 um, two months later. And she says, I'll be back. That left eye will be back to equal to the right eye in a few weeks. There was a minor issue, but still appreciated. I didn't lose my hair. Um, the infectious diseases doctor said 55 days of these powerful antibiotics could cause me to lose my hair. Not quite so bad as chemotherapy. I wasn't going to go bald, but I was going to have like patchy places that there was no hair and really thin. But it didn't happen. Yay. But the best news is my brain suffered no permanent effects from that vegetative mass deposited um, in making septic strokes. So now it's getting time for me to be discharged and all the specialists who are coming into my room all the time um, assessed my abilities and recommended no cognitive therapy. I can still think and problem solve. No physical therapy. I got so I could walk. I could control my large muscles. No occupational therapy. I had no fine motor difficulties. No speech language therapy. <laughs> I could still communicate like before. But I'm going to tell you about a test, a cognitive test that the SLP gave me. So the young SLP walks into my room and introduces herself. And I say, where did you go to graduate school? <laughs> I hope she didn't think I was like seeing if she was qualified, but I'm always interested in what <laughs> grad school people are at. She said she went to Ohio State, all right? So then she proceeded to ask me some questions 
from a standardized exam. So I pipe up with, what's the name of this test? <laughs> it's called, this is a weird name, SLUMS, which stands for St. Louis University Mental Status. So I'm going to give you the slums now. I'm sure I quizzed her in a way that most patients don't. So here are the questions, and the top score is 30 points. What day of the week is it? You're probably saying last day of finals week. What is the year? What state are we in? And each one is worth a point. Please remember these five objects. Well, I don't like the wording of this test because you don't get to see any objects. You just hear spoken labels. So she says, apple, pen, tie, house, car. But, you know, if you'd see them, I think it would be an extra assist. All right, here's one that will make you laugh. You have $100 and you go to the store and buy a dozen apples for $3 and a tricycle for $20. How much did you spend? How much do you have left? You know what I said? I know what you're trying to do. You're trying to get me to add 20 and 3 and subtract from 100. I don't do that. <laughs> I don't do that without a calculator. And I go, and I'm a baseline. Unfortunately, that's the way I used to be. I'm that way again. All right, here you go. Name as many animals as you can in one minute. So just start counting and think of as many animals as you can. I'm timing you. See if we can get to three points. Time. How many did you get? Do you have cognitive impairment? <laughs> or have you just had finals? So what was your system? Did you try to have some kind of strategy? Did you like go to the farm first and then to the zoo or? Okay. I went through the alphabet, so I was thinking like aardvark, you know, going through to zebra. Um, but at any rate, it's good to have a system to try to categorize in some way. So ignore the circle for a minute. Um, what were the five objects I asked you to remember? She got all five. <laughs> All right, I'm going to give you a series of numbers. Now, you can't see these. You have a big advantage here. So I'm going to give you a series of numbers, and I would like you to give them to me backwards, she said. For example, if I say 4-2, you would say 2-4. Okay, you're not able to see these if you're the patient. 8-7. Now, if you say 7-8, you can still get no points. You, it's just like a practice. All right, 649, 8537, <laughs> this is a clock face, put in the hour hand and the time at 10 minutes to 11 o'clock. Okay, so that's not so easy. I remember when I first came out of it, and I'm looking at the clock, not when she gave me the test, that was quite a ways. Um, but when I first came out of it and I'm looking at a clock and I'm going, I know those hands are supposed to tell me something. I know the short hand and the long hand are supposed to tell me something. But I was struggling to realize how to tell time, which my nephew noticed and he told his mother, Aunt Jean can't tell time. <laughs> Place an X in the triangle. Which of the figures is largest? Did you say the square? I'm going to tell you a story. Listen carefully, because afterwards, I'm going to ask you some questions about it. 
Jill was a very successful stockbroker. She made a lot of money on the stock market. She then met Jack, a devastatingly handsome man. She married him, married him and had three children. They lived in Chicago. She then stopped work and stayed at home to bring up her children. When they were teenagers, she went back to work. She and Jack lived happily ever after. <laughs> what was the female's name? Okay. What work did she do? When did she go back to work? What state did she live in? Very good. Can't say Chicago. So now the slum score depends on the patient's level of education. High school or more education, you had to get 27 points at least, 27 to 30 to be labeled normal cognition, 21 to 26 points mild neurocognitive disorder, 1 to 20 points impaired cognition. But you could have a little bit lower scores if you didn't have any education. So less than high school education, 25 to 30 um, is normal, 20 to 24 is mild, and 1 to 19 is impaired. All right, so I, I guess she said I was okay because I didn't get any cognitive therapy. So now my new status was outpatient. And I just really believed that getting home would be so wonderful. But that was a short-lived feeling because I soon felt the stress of being an outpatient. I required medical care every weekday for many weeks. I was sent to different locations for blood tests repeatedly and x-rays repeatedly. I was sent to an infusion center and I tried hard to have it be in my town, but it ha I had to go to an adjacent town where, city, where nurses mixed my antibiotic fresh every day. I had to go to the offices of my infectious diseases doctor, my primary care doctor, who was monitoring my reaction to blood thinner medicine, my cardiac surgeon, my cardiologist, two different people, and two ophthalmologists. I was sent to attend three times weekly cardiac rehab sessions. And here's the kicker, I wasn't allowed to drive. So Wilt would drive me some. My son, Ben, the only one who's local, and he's in Broomfield, he would drive me some. And this was really tedious because we would start in the morning and it could be six hours of driving to different doctors before we were done for the day. I could only ask that of Wilt and Ben. So when they couldn't do it, I would line up all different drivers. I'd say, okay, at 9.30, can you drop me off here? And then the next person. At 10.45, can you pick me up here and take me there? And the next person to the next place. And I would lay awake nights before, you know, the next day going, did I account for everything? Did I give everybody the right time? Is this going to work? And I was explaining to somebody how it was stressful, and, and she said, it was probably really good for your brain. So I go, okay, good. <laughs> so here's um, a kind of gory picture, but <laughs> um, I did want a picture taken of me with a cord coming out of my body. And you can see my eight inch um, heart surgery scar. It looks pretty good now. Um, I don't even hide it. I'll wear a v-neck and just think, it tells a story. It's fine with me. Um, but what I'm really wanting you to look at is to the side. Uh, that's where the antibiotic, the oxacillin, was administered around the clock. So when I was in the hospital, the drug was in an IV bag suspended by my bed. But when I was an outpatient, they gave me a bag in a case, and in the case was this pump and tube. And so I carried that case around all the time. And in addition to changing that antibiotic bag every day, which I couldn't see, 
you had to puncture the bag, and I was blind in this eye. I had no depth perception. I could not change my antibiotic bag. So Wilt did it almost all the time. Ben did it occasionally. Um, so every day the bag had to be changed, and then every other day, that tube, the part that was closest to my body had to be flushed with a saline solution, and then this connection, a new tube had to be connected every other day, and then every two to three days, the battery in the pump had to be replaced. Okay, I think I said all that. I'm gonna tell you about an especially stressful day. My friend Karen picks me up from the hospital as I'm discharged the third time. We walk out of the hospital room chatting and leaving behind my case with the antibiotic bag. The nurse had come in and taken me, disconnected me from the IV bag and waited for, well, she didn't wait. She said, wait here for the hospitalist who has to see you and sign you out. So. He came, he said, you're good to go, and we left. Well, I didn't have my case, and I didn't have my antibiotic bag. At home, it's time for Wilt to change my bag. Catherine was there. Remember, there was this frantic search. I call Karen, I go, is it in your car? Is that case with the bag and the pump in your car? She searches everywhere. No, and we search the house, it's nowhere. So I call the nurse, I call the hospital, I reach the nurse, she goes, well, it's not here, it's not in the room, we have a new patient in here, your room's been cleaned. I go, uh-oh. So I call again, I was being a pest. Could you check the lost and found? Could you find that case? No case. Third phone call, I wouldn't quit. I now have gone to the nursing supervisor and um, his name is Eric, and he promised to conduct a thorough search. Hallelujah. Success at finding the antibiotic bag and the case. I found out the replacement cost was $3,000, and I don't know if insurance would have covered that. They already covered it the first time. Um, but Eric found it on a shelf in the hospital hallway above a wheelchair in a little niche in the hall. It wasn't supposed to be there, but I think the hospital cleaning crew just didn't bother to take it to the lost and found. They just cleaned it, tucked it away somewhere, went on their way. I write a letter of commendation to Eric's boss. Only one recommendation. Everybody released me from any therapy, except I did need to go to cardiac rehab. So I would um, be wearing electrodes in four places, and they would monitor on a computer while I was on the treadmill, um, on the elliptical trainer, lifting weights uh, three times a week for three months. I graduated in April, no restrictions, no limitations, but it's not like I am before because my endurance is not good. My stamina is not like it was. Um, I run to catch a light rail and I am worn out. I go up flights of stairs and I'm worn out. I go hiking, snowshoeing, I do it, but it wears me out. And my voice isn't like it was before. I would used to be able to project to all of you, but I need a mic. Um, I'm weaker now, and I think my voice is more gravelly. Um, I can't sing. I can't sustain voice. Ah, here's a question for you. How much do you think it costs to save my life? Almost. It was, I got it down to the penny, 733,934 and 85 cents. So it rounds to 734,000, which is several thousand under three-fourths of a million dollars. My cost, 3,300, whew. Ah, an insight I gained from all this, I'm loved. 
A lot of people were praying for my recovery. Between the second and the third hospitalization, I want to tell you something sweet. I apologized to Wilt for not getting him a Christmas present, and he said, you already did. I recovered. So many friends and family visited me a lot in the hospital. So many sent thoughtful cards and emails, including a lot from current students. It was really meaningful. So many beautiful bouquets delivered, including one from former students who asked Catherine for my home address, and I received this beautiful bouquet, and several students had signed. Very touching. You want to hear my near-death experience? So I didn't have, like, light with a loved one like my father beckoning me to the other side, which sort of makes me worried. <laughs> there was no light, but there was something else. And I, am, I believe this image appeared early in my staph infection. Maybe even that very first day before Wilt found me and I was just on my way down. Um, I have really very few clear memories of those first couple of weeks. Um, kind of disjointed images, um, recalled events, but not good memory of the first couple of weeks. But this experience is vivid. So I'm hiking. I don't know if it's because I was hiking as my last good memory before the staph infection, but I am hiking and I come to this long crevice and I'm straddling it. And the next step is critical, so it commands my attention. If I step with my right foot, it, and it wasn't clear to me at the moment, it's going to be easy, it's going to be comfortable, but if you take the step with the right foot, people are going to cry. If I step with the left foot, it's going to be hard as hell. I really remember those words, hard as hell. But I took the next step with my left foot. And I really feel it was a choice to fight the infection when I was you know, close to not being able to manage, but I said, I'm fighting. And so the staph infection didn't win. My body won. It didn't get overtake me. And thankfully, I have no residual effects, except reduced stamina and endurance and reduced vocal quality and output. Um, and maybe that'll all resolve in time. Most important, I'm still me. At, at my last visit, that's kind of what the, what the cardiac surgeon did. Instead of applauding, gives me a big hug and says, you are a walking miracle. So I want to say some thank yous um, to my wonderful and much, much appreciated family, my four sons. Ben was through it thick and thin at the hospital frequently. Um, my other sons were touching base frequently, but they were out of state. My dear daughters-in-law, my so here's Ben, Colin, whoops, I can't, you can't see that. <laughs> ben, Colin, Danny, Andrew. Here's my brothers. Well, I'm the oldest, but not by much. <laughs> my insane parents had four kids in five years. my mom. My mom died just as I was getting better mid-January, but she knew I was getting better. There's Wilt. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he's, he's in good with the family. He got me to the hospital in time. I uh, changed my antibiotic bag daily. I was with me through thick and thin through this bacterial misadventure. Thank you to my dear friends and colleagues, Jessica, who taught my students, graded their term papers, their final exams, when she barely had time enough for her own students and her own classes. Catherine, who came out of retirement to advise my students to grade their observation reports and who visited me regularly in the hospital and at home. 
to my additional much appreciated colleagues, Paula, who suddenly became SLHS coordinator <laughs> without her mentor to help ease her into the task. Christy, who stepped in to teach three audiology classes for me when I couldn't. Kim, who taught my American Sign Language sections in addition to hers. Everyone was so nice, even though I wasn't at a resort. <laughs> You're so sweet. <laughs>